Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to AJ 507 Ethics in Criminal Justice. My name is Tony Farrar, and of course, I am your instructor for this semester. Today's lecture is going to cover chapter one, where we're going to take a look at morality, ethics, and human behavior. And I have a lot of content to cover, so I'm either going to do two shorter segments, maybe 30-minute 30, 30 segments, uh, so two videos, or if there's not that much in the particular chapter that we're covering, I'll try to keep it just to one video of maybe 45 minutes, but we'll see how it goes. We'll kind of play that by ear, but with that said, let's go ahead and jump right in because we do have a lot of information to cover. So some of the learning objectives, uh, we want to explain the difference between ethical issues and ethical dilemmas. Uh, provide some examples of how discretion permeates, means kind of flows throughout every phase of the criminal justice system and creates these ethical dilemmas for criminal justice professionals. Explain why the study of ethics is important for criminal justice professionals. Learn some of the definitions, morals, ethics, values. Describe what behaviors might be subject to moral or ethical judgment. So again, a lot of information to cover. So let's go ahead and, and just jump in. So ethical judgments permeate our lives. I mean, you employ ethical analysis when you decide to utter a white lie to get out of doing something that you don't want to do, or when you call in sick on that, you know, sunny beach day, right? Being honest in your interactions with others is a generally recognized duty. Therefore, these decisions can be judged as wrong. Small decisions about behavior are often made without thinking of the ethical implications of these choices. And, and larger ones might have a, a, a different outcome. So in, in this chapter, we're going to explore ethical decision making. More specifically, we're going to explore the ethical dilemmas and issues within the criminal justice system. Okay. Um, and, and, and there's a lot, again, a lot of content that we have to cover. So the criminal justice system can be examined using political, legal, organizational, or sociological approaches. However, we are shifting the focus just a bit to look at the system through an ethics lens or an ethics um, kind of focus or perspective. You know, an example would be asking if something is legal is not necessarily the same as whether something is right. Okay, so that's just kind of kind of where we're gonna we're gonna go for this particular chapter. So ethical discussions in criminal justice focus on issues or dilemmas. Ethical issues are, are these broad social questions often concerning the government's social control mechanisms and the impact on those governed. And these issues can be subject to legal analysis and or ethical analysis since the two are related but not really the same. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. So by definition, an ethical issue is a difficult social or policy question that includes controversy over the right thing to do. Broad social questions often concerning, again, the government's social control mechanisms and the impact, okay, on those governed. So following, you know, if you're following in your textbook, we're on, we're on about page two, um, here's a couple of few, you know, a few current issues in the field of criminal justice that can be subject to ethical analysis. It could be decriminalization of marijuana. And you've seen how that has actually changed, how public perception over the years 
has changed in many states. Reversing mandatory minimum laws for drug crimes. Abolishing the death penalty. Using private prisons, maybe even for profit. Requiring law enforcement to have liability insurance. That's interesting, right? Civilian review boards. Sanctuary cities. Mandatory DNA collection for anybody arrested. So the typical individual does not have much control over these issues. Um, you know, if one, if one is a political or organizational leader, it is possible that within that person's discretion to decide some ethical issues, but generally some of these choices are decided by political action um, or deliberation by many people. But again, ethical issues, those are difficult social policy questions, okay? that really include controversy over, you know, the right thing to do, okay? Next, we have ethical dilemmas. While ethical issues are broad social questions or policy decisions, ethical dilemmas are situations in which one person must decide what to do. Either the choice is unclear or or the right choice will be difficult uh, because of the costs involved. Every one of us has faced an ethical dilemma. Our dilemmas involve our jobs and our interactions with others. Criminal justice professionals face dilemmas arising from the choices that they are faced with during their employment. And dilemmas of criminal justice are going to include a couple of things we're going to look at here. But again, ethical dilemmas, situations <clears throat> in which it is difficult for an individual to decide, either because the right course of action is not clear or because the right course of action carries some type of negative consequence. So here's a list of some of these ethical dilemmas as it relates to law enforcement. Um, law enforcement's decision whether to write a ticket to a traffic violator. A police, officer's, uh, a police officer's decision to tell a supervisor that their partner has maybe an alcohol problem. A defense attorney's decision to actually accept a case. A prosecutor's decision on, wh on you know, what to charge. Probation officer's decision on whether to violate a client. So these are, you know, all interesting dilemmas, okay? And, and, and part of the dilemma thing is what we call that word discretion. The authority to make a decision between two or more choices. The greater the role discretion plays in a profession, and law enforcement, there's a lot of discretion, right? The more important is a strong grounding in ethics. So I, I hope that kind of makes sense. So by definition, ethical dilemma, situations in which it is difficult for someone to decide because either it's not clear or the decision that you make might carry some negative consequence, right? So why then do we want to study ethics, especially in criminal justice? Well, although the decisions faced by professionals associated with the criminal justice system ranging from legislators who write the laws to correctional professionals who supervise prisoners may be different, they all have similarities, especially in that all of these professionals all experience, experience varying degrees of discretion, right? Authority and power. Remember discretion, the authority to make a decision between two choices. So they, they all have that. If decisions were 
totally bounded by legal rules or policy regulations, then perhaps there would be less reason for ethical analysis. However, the greater role, again, that I, I said this earlier, discretion plays in a profession and in criminal justice, it plays a huge role. The more important is a strong grounding in, you know, in, in this ethics. So again, why, why study ethics at all? So let's take a look at it. So ethical issues exist in all areas of the criminal justice system, from the passage of laws to punishment. And learning how to determine the right thing to do is really critical. As I said, criminal justice professionals have varying degrees of discretion, authority, and power. And, and criminal justice professionals encounter a multitude of situations in which they have to make choices that are going to affect somebody's life. And, and if that's not enough, we, we're going to kind of go into each little piece now. So let's talk about legislators, people that make the laws, right? So legislators have the power to define certain acts as legal and therefore punishable. They also have the power to set the amount of punishment. You know, public safety is usually the reason for, or the reason given for criminalizing certain forms of behavior. In, in other cases, really, legislators employ moral definitions for deciding which behaviors should be legal. Cops didn't decide the marijuana laws. Legislators put it on the ballot and the people voted on it. So I hope you can see that the difference there. Protection of the public morality is the rationale for some laws, including those involving, um, you know, drugs, gambling, prostitution, etc. Now, while judges invalidate laws that run basically counterintuitive or afoul um, of state and federal constitution, legislators still have a great deal of discretion in setting the laws that we live by. There is sometimes no consensus on laws, especially those that concern private behavior. So an example could be several years ago, some states you know, um, had laws recognizing same-sex marriage and others had laws that prohibited. Okay, now there's a case law that says that, uh, you know, that kind of cleared all that up. Um, in 2015, the Supreme Court held that all states must license and recognize same-sex marriages. But, you know, states, again, the legislation defines a lot of this, right? All right, so we kind of talked about how, you know, uh, legislators employ moral definitions, behaviors, etc. So what about police officers? Well, police officers who enforce the laws created by legislators also have a great deal of discretionary power, right? Most of us, in fact, you know, have benefited from this discretion when we received a warning instead of a traffic ticket. And, and if you just got the ticket, I'm sorry. You know, police officers have the power to deprive people of their liberty through arrest and the power to decide which individual to investigate and perhaps focus on for undercover operations. They also have the power to decide that lethal force is warranted. Now, in the United States, we enjoy constitutional protections um, you know, against, you know, police, certain police powers and, and, and the police act as the guardians of law, not merely enforcers uh, for those in power. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, in chapters five through seven, the, eco, the ethical use of police discretion and police force. Now, prosecutors probably face the least public scrutiny of all criminal justice professionals, which is ironic because they possess a great deal of discretion in deciding whom and how to prosecute. They decide which charges to pursue and which to drop, which cases to take to a grand jury, how to prosecute a case, 
and whether to pursue the death penalty in a homicide case. And although prosecutors have an ethical duty to pursue justice rather than conviction, some critics argue that at times their decision-making seems to be influenced by politics or factors other than that goal of justice. So again, prosecutors, they're the ones that decide those particular charges. Defense attorneys have ethical duties similar to prosecutors in some ways. However, they also have a unique duty to their client, right? So they have kind of an interesting, you know, they're, they're set in an interesting kind of form. After deciding whether to take a case or not, they decide whether to encourage a client to agree to a plea deal, what evidence to utilize and how to try the case and whether to encourage a, a client to appeal if they actually lose their case. So that, that's an interesting thing in itself. Even judges. Judges possess incredible power. Decisions to deny or accept plea bargain decisions uh, regarding the rules of evidence and the, the, the course of, of sentencing. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, you know, chapters eight through 10, we're gonna take a look at and explore the ec ethical issues of legal professionals in the criminal justice system. And then finally, correctional officers or officials have immense powers over the lives of, of some citizens. You know, uh, probation officers make recommendations in, in pre-sentence reports and violation reports that affect whether a person goes to prison. And, and, and that's, you know, pretty stressful, right? You know, prison officials decide to award or take away good time. And they may punish an, an, an inmate with, uh, you know, segregation. Both types of decisions affect the individual's liberty. Uh, correctional officers make daily decisions that affect the life and health of prisoners uh, that they supervise. So, it's, uh, you know, you can see that there's just a lot of discretion everywhere, right? Parole officers. When we talk about parole officers, um, you know, or the, even the officials, they decide when to file a violation report and make other decisions that affect a parolee as well as his or her family members. In short, correctional professionals have a great deal of discretion over the lives that they control. So just a, a lot of things for us to think about, right? Um, and although the professionals discussed, you know, that we've looked at, they face different dilemmas, right? Each one is a little bit different. They also share very similar elements. So they have some common elements. So here they are when we talked about all those different things, right? So the first one, they all have the power to make decisions. They each have the duty of enforcing the law. They must accept that their duty is to protect the constitutional safeguards that are the cornerstone of our legal system, specifically due process and equal protection. And then finally, they are all public servants. So while each one individually can be faced with their own ethical dilemmas, etc., okay, they do have a lot of commonalities, right, when it comes to some of the elements. So discretion, enforcing the laws, equal protection, due process, and they are all public servants. So kind of keeping that in mind, let's kind of move on and let's talk a little bit about, and we're still talking about why study ethics. So Felknes, um, a, a criminal justice professional also kind of gave us some information on 
you know, why criminal justice professionals should study ethics. So if you're following along or you want to know, I'll give you a little bit more. So if you, it, it's on page, uh, page seven, okay, where it talks about um, Felknez um, explained why the study of ethics is important. Okay, um, so one would be to become more professional. You know, professionals are recognized as such in part a profession you know, normally includes a set of ethical requirements as part of its meaning, right? Professionalism, profession. So there you have that. Um, you know, to begin developing critical thinking skills. So, you know, training in ethics helps develop these critical thinking and analytical skills and reasoning abilities that are needed to understand some of the aspects of the criminal justice system. Uh, to quickly recognize the ethical consequences of various actions. So criminal justice professionals should be able to recognize quickly the ethical consequences of various actions and the moral principles involved. Um, you know, central to decisions involving use of force. Ethical considerations, they are central to decisions involving discretion, force, and due process, right? Um, that require people to make, you know, enlightened moral judgments. And germane to most management and police decisions concerning such issues as rehabilitation, deterrence, um, and just deserts, meaning penalties. And then finally, number six, um, ethical considerations are essential aspects of criminal justice research. So because it's central to more research, these are all ways, um, you know, why it's important to study um, ethics and criminal justice. Now, we also note that individuals who ignore ethics do so at their peril, meaning that if you ignore it, then, hey, it's on you, right? They may find themselves sliding down that slippery slope of behaviors that threaten their career and personal well-being. And even if their actions are not discovered, many people suffer from a moral crisis when they realize how far their actions have strayed from their moral ideals. And, and we can summarize this with three basic points. We study ethics because Criminal justice is uniquely involved in coercion, which means there are many and varied opportunities to abuse power. Number two, almost all criminal justice professionals are public servants and, because of that, owe special duties to the public they served. And then finally, number three, we study ethics to sensitize students to ethical issues and provide tools to help identify and resolve ethical dilemmas they may face in their professional lives. So those are just some, some, some reasons, okay, or some basic points. So if you're following along still, we're about on page eight as we're going through, and now we're gonna kind of look at some defining terms, okay? And we're going to talk a little bit about morals versus ethics. The, and these two words are often interchangeably used. So the words morals and ethics, again, are often used in daily conversation. For example, when public officials use their offices for personal profit, or when politicians accept bribes from special interest groups, they are described as unethical. When an individual does a good deed, engages in charitable activities or a personal sacrifice, or takes a stand against wrongdoing, we might describe that person as a moral person. Often the terms morals and ethics are used interchangeably. And we kind of talked about that. And here's a little chart that kind of gives you the meaning and talks a little bit more about it. But let's, let's kind of look at it a little bit more. So morals, by definition, principles of right and wrong. The term moral is often used as an adjective 
to describe somebody's actions. Okay. And again, we know that the words are often used interchangeably. The Greek word ethos pertains to, you know, custom behavioral practices or character. And the term morals is a Latin based word with similar meaning. Just to kind of give you a little bit more, um, you know, kind of on the definition. Okay. Now, on the other hand, ethics, okay, is the discipline of determining good and evil and defining moral duties. And the term ethics is often used as an adjective to refer to behaviors relating to a profession. So an example would be the Hippocratic Oath that a physician might take. So hopefully that kind of kind of helps out a little bit as it relates to, um, you know, morals versus ethics. Now, morals and morality refer to what is judged as good contact, uh, you know, conduct. Immorality then refers to bad conduct. And we would judge someone who intentionally, let's say, harms a child for his own enjoyment or someone who steals from a church collection plate as immoral. Now, some of us disagree on whether other behaviors, such as capital punishment, euthanasia, etc., are immoral, because we have differences of opinion, right? How to resolve such questions will be the subject of kind of our next part of the conversation. So again, the term ethics refers to the study and analysis of what constitutes good or bad conduct. And there are several branches, okay, or schools of ethics. So let me say that again. The term ethics refers to the study and analysis of what constitutes good or bad conduct. And there are a couple of definitions that I'm going to share with you, but there are branches of ethics. So you have meta, you have meta ethics technical investigation of the meaning of ethical systems, their origins, etc. You have normative ethics, definition of right conduct and moral duties, applied ethics, the application of ethical principles to specific issues or fields. So it could be criminal justice, it could be nursing, it could be etc. Professional ethics, examination of the behavior of certain professional groups. OK, so those are some like, you know, subcategories, if you will. Um, there's a couple more that we're going to talk about and we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but duties, behaviors or actions necessary for an individual to be considered moral. Um, super regoratories, actions that are commendable but not required in order for a person to be considered moral. And then imperfect duties, moral duties that are not fully um, explicated or detailed. So while these definitions of ethics refer to the study of right and wrong behavior, more often in common usage, again, ethics is used as an adjective, ethical or unethical, to refer to behaviors relating to a, a, a profession, while moral is used as an adjective to describe a person's action in other spheres of life. So most professions have codes of conduct that describe what is ethical behavior in that particular profession. So hopefully that makes sense. And then if you look on page nine in your textbook, um, it talks, you, you can see in the little box there, you have some ideas, information from Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, um, and the Stoics. All right. So I gave you a couple definitions. We talked about uh, duties, et cetera. So now we're going to move on to values. So values are defined as elements of desirability, worth, or importance. You may say that you value honesty. Another way of saying it is that one of your values is honesty. Others may value you know, physical health, friendship, uh, material success, or even family. 
individual values form the value system and all people prioritize certain things that they consider important in life. So, you know, when you look at some examples here again, um, these are things that are, uh, you know, ha have elements of desirability or worth or importance. So could be honesty, health, family, financial success, how you look, I mean, all these things like that. Um, a lot of times though, we may not really know what our values are until you have to choose them, right? Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. Sometimes we don't know and our values really aren't clear until there's a choice that has to be made. So an example would be uh, when you have to choose between, let's say, friendship and honesty or material success and family. That really identifies our values. And one way to kind of figure that out, a little fun exercise, and you can do it later, would be to rank these values that you see here in order of importance, with number one being the most important, and then kind of so on. So it's kind of interesting to see how, have a couple people in your family or your friend or somebody do that, and then compare your answers to see kind of, you know, how that, how that comes out. Sometimes it's kind of interesting. So... Values as judgments of worth are often equated with moral judgments of goodness. And we see that both can be distinguished from factual judgments, which can be empirically verified. So, um, you know, he's lying, it is raining, and an example of value judgment, she's a good woman, that was a wonderful day. So, I mean, there's just a couple of examples that they actually list in your, in your textbook. So now let's talk a little bit about um, making moral judgments. So we make moral or ethical judgments, you know, all the time. And it could be, again, I'm just throwing some out here. It could be abortion is wrong. Capital punishment is just. Um, it's good to give. You should put in a full day's work for a full day's pay. Uh, you should not take credit for another person's work. These are all judgments of good and bad behavior. We also make choices knowing that they can be right or wrong. Okay. So not all behaviors, and I think we'll finish this part and we'll take our first little break. Not all behaviors involve questions of ethics though. Acts that can be judged as ethical or unethical, moral or immoral, basically involve four elements. First would be the act. First, some act must have been performed. Second would be only human acts. So, you know, judgment of moral and ethical behavior are directed specifically to human behavior. Okay, next would be free will. In addition to limiting discussions of morality to human behavior, we usually further restrict the discussion to behavior that stems from free will. And then finally, the last one, um, it affects others. Finally, we, we usually discuss moral and immoral behavior only in which it affects others. Okay, so I think this might be a good time to take our first break. Um, so we'll kind of Take a little bit of a, a break here. I'll stop and then we'll come back for part two of chapter one.